Tonight's guest, Whitey Besson, on average twice a year for about 10 minutes a time. That's 300 minutes. That's five hours of discussions. And tonight's the first night that I've ever met him face to face. It's a real pleasure to have you here, Whitey Besson. Thank, Thank you. you. Explain to me something, and something that's always bothered me. How does somebody called James Wellwood Basson get born in a place like Porterville in the Western Cape? The birth part was easy. The James Wellwood was the difficult part. Where does James Wellwood come from? It was a, 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 a Scottish gentleman who didn't have any children, and my father decided to name me after him. And it didn't go well in Portoville, so they had to find a shorter name. So I think they kept a W for Whitey. Uh, so when, when did you become Whitey? Were you Whitey from the start? Yeah, I think when I was, since I can remember, I had those days blonde hair, not white hair, but uh, they didn't know the difference at that stage in Portoville. So you, can be, you were whitey as a child, so then yeah, yeah. whitey. But James Wellwood, when you go through passport control, that's what your passport yeah. says. Yeah. Or well, my mother talks to me, obviously. Yeah, no, absolutely. James Wellwood, passport. <laughs> Did, do you get into trouble a lot with your mum? No, not that often. <laughs> <laughs> um, when we, we, we look at your, your family history, it's really interesting. Your dad practiced law, yes. um, went off to the war, came back, and actually was in politics with Jan Smuts in, in the United yes. Party, and he was a member of parliament. Yes, I think he and Paul Sauer were the longest two serving MPs uh, in those days. So I don't know what happens today. But yes, he was in parliament for a long time. There's a wine named after Paul Sauer. What happened to your dad? I think he, he probably had a brandy <laughs> named after him. <laughs> um, because the, the law runs through your family. Your maternal grandfather was a lawyer. Christo Visa, your business partner of many, many, many years, qualified as a lawyer. Why did you choose to become a shopkeeper? I didn't actually. I wanted to become a medical student, but my mother said I was afraid of blood, so I didn't. Would you be been a decent doctor? Because you did consider quite seriously. No, I actually applied. I actually, uh, I actually got admitted to UCT, but I never went there. Would you have been a good doctor? I'm not sure. I was I'm looking at your family. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm, not sure. I'm not paying poker with your family, by the way. They, they give away nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Depends what they paid in those days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, doctors get paid an awful lot, but I don't think you would have been happy. Um, BCom, articles at PwC. You joined PEP, but you'd met Christo Visa at Stellenbosch. Yeah, Christo was in Stellenbosch like a year ahead of me. Mm -hmm. Spent a few years at UCT and then came to Stellenbosch. So obviously when you had your interview, you can see he's substantially older than me. So no, much, much older. So yeah. it's strange that we're actually friends. But <laughs> <laughs> but did you hit it off right at the start? In, yeah, we were very at close at Varsity and we were both in the... Or he came from a sap house, if you can call it that way. And yeah, my father blutsup. Was, he calls himself yeah. a blutsup. Yeah, so, so obviously we weren't too many of us, so we, <laughs> we were <laughs> close together. And then when I, did my, when I finished my articles at, uh, at Ernest & Young, actually, okay. then I went to PwC and I did a few smaller audits for them. And then Christo's cousin, who was the CEO and chairman of the company, asked me to... Because he founded Pep, uh, yeah. Christo's cousin, he founded Pep in Uppington. Yeah. In Uppington, and then he came, to, he came from Uppington straight into Cape Town, opened up a couple of stores, and uh, in 71, they wanted to do a listing, and I was then the auditor for PwC, so he asked me to join the company. Okay. Which I did. Christo stayed there till, till 74, I think it was, because in October of 74, uh, his uncle thought that at the tender age of 28, I should become the business director or whatever he called it in those days. And how was how big was Pep then? Was it 20, 30 stores? No, it was then already by the 100 there in the 74s. And then Christo went to practice at the bar and then bought the diamond mine. Yeah. So we only really met up in 80 again when after uh, I bought uh, ShopRite in 79 and in 80 he bought his cousin's shares out so that he became the controlling shareholder. Uh, what was the secret of Pep? What, was, what made Pep great? You know, Pep was, a, uh, Van Rooyen was probably one of the best traders I, I've, that I've met. And Van Rooyen is Christo's cousin? Yeah. Okay. Christo's, no, Christo's cousin's husband. Second. 
Ja, zeker. Close to Familie. that. Familie. Familie. Ja. Uh, but Van Rijn was a brilliant man, uh, not just mentally, he was also just a very good marketing man, and he had this passion to supply uh, people with clothing, affordable clothing, not cheap, cheap, cheap clothing, but affordable clothing so that everybody uh, uplifts and, and, and looks good in his clothing. And he, he kept that market very much under his hand, and in those days against Edgar's and a few of the big guys that came in against us, Scott's, there was half price stores. Um, and they were smaller, but they were they were all there. Mm. I mean, when you look at Pep, and your Pep grew by acquisition, I think you bought half price stores, didn't you? I bought that, yeah. Uh, it was actually a nice story, which I can tell for your Please. audience, yeah. Yeah, the, the guy who ran half post stores was a young guy called Sam Stupel, who was a, a very ambitious guy. But he seemed to follow us uh, with everything that we did. So, uh, so I knew that he used to phone me like on a Monday, Tuesday, and speak to me about the sales figures of the different stores. So I knew he had the sales figures in front of him because they were in computer uh, um, frequency. So it, it wasn't A, B, C. Yeah, it yeah. was 101, 1, 2, yeah. etc. So I knew he had that he had some inside track with us. And I thought I'd catch him, and I sent out a circular that we're going into food. And, the <laughs> and then he started applying for food licenses. <laughs> and I, <laughs> and I, <laughs> I caught him in the death tracks there with about a couple hundred of tons on its way from India. And <laughs> so I sold rice even in pep stores to get rid of it at the stage when <laughs> I mean, you when you look at Pep and you look, I mean, what are they? They were 1,400 Pep core stores in Eastern Europe, in Hungary and in Poland and the Czech Republic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, can you believe it? Yeah, there's more. There's in Czech Republic. There's a lot. I actually visited them last year. They, they're doing very well there as well. In despite that it's Europe or Eastern Europe, but um, the, the 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 GDP. Per capita in, in Euros is doing very well in a place like Poland. So quite yeah. obviously there's a very strong growth in the in the in the in the level of, of wealth of the Czech people. And uh, that helps a lot. How long they're gonna be just loyal Pep customers, I can't tell you, but currently they're there. But the new guys are also coming in the the British retailers and the German retailers are all coming in there, so so it's it's gonna be a, a nice debate. But there's a lot of countries around it that Pep can still go to. Explain to me then, please, um, the ShopRite acquisition, because ShopRite was started by the Rogat family, um, yep. and there were, what, eight stores when, when you decided to buy them. Were you and Christo in business together at this point, or was this no. an independent move by you, or was it a Pep move, what was it? No, no, it was uh, Martin Shane, the then chairman of Dagson's actually phoned me and was, said he would want to sell the company, that there was a company for sale with two guys who'd broken up, or whose partnership was being broken up by the frac uh, 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 friction between the wives or brothers-in-laws or uh, family unit. And he, he offered it to us. Now, we, I, I had then studied, uh, not studied, but went with Rainier on a trip to Who's Europe. Rainier? Van Rijn. Okay. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's like these How movie stars. It's these movie stars who always talk about. Well, I was with James and with Mary, and we're yeah. supposed to know who they're talking about. Now, he was the movie the star, but you should have. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a lovely guy, and um, between '74, Christo left a Pip for yeah. a long time, and between '74 and about '77, '78, I basically ran Pip stores at that very uh, mature age of 28. And then um, I, then he came back, and obviously when the old boss comes back and there's a new boss in place, then things don't work out that well. And I was very fond of him, so I spent days and hours and nights with him just learning business. So I said, I, I can't have a fight with you, and you're disrupting what I've actually put into place. So I think I must go and do something else. So he says, what did you want to do? So I said, I, I think, first of all, I want to leave you, but secondly, <laughs> <laughs> secondly, it'll be quite nice to do some fast-moving uh, product like food. So we managed to get people in, in the UK that took us to, to Europe, 
And we, we were, I first went to have a look at the Aldi's, but they chucked me out every time I went to their stores. They were good at, at knowing that we were looking at their business. And then I spent time with a company called um, Meta in Italy, which was part of Pam Supermarkets. Okay. And on the verge of doing a joint venture for a limited assortment for South Africa, I, I was very fond with them. And then and, and between them, myself, and Pep, we would have done a limited assortment. Then I like the Aldi's or the sure. Lidl's. And then uh, Martin Shane phoned me and said, there's this business that you can buy. And it was just so good a buy that, that uh, I couldn't refuse it. Nearly went shipwreck at some stage, and then uh, a lot of politics, and there's still lots of arguments about who should own what. But uh, I then started it, uh, left my office in end of 79 uh, with a car and a briefcase. And Van Ruen said, take five guys with you. They don't have to be clever. They must just support you because <laughs> you're going to have a hell of a time. And, uh, uh, got into a place in Lansdowne, sat in a, in a chair that kept on tilting because the previous guy that was sitting there was about 400 kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> so, but learned a lot because every day I walked through a different aisle going to my office. Now, the office was upstairs in the storeroom. The offices, there were five. But it was also in the way of the chute that there was sending the boxes down with yeah. so you had a time very well to get to the top <laughs> <laughs> and then you start from nothing because there's an old uh, family fantastic guys Gerald would know them Barney Rogan was also fantastic yeah. to teach me food and he then taught me how to run a supermarket and then uh, I started buying a, a couple of very uh, we're going to talk about the deals. I want to talk about the deals. This is, this yeah. is White of Asondo famously um, bought a couple of interesting businesses, the Ackerman's food business, of course, and then there was that famous OK Bazaars deal. Some liabilities, of course, but he paid a rand. Whitey Bisson is our studio guest this evening. People, Whitey Bisson, look at the massive success of ShopRite over many, many years and think it was probably quite easy. But like many people struggle with landlords today, when you started out, you had landlords didn't know that you were going to be big and famous one day. Um, who gave you trouble? They, they, they pushed you around, they bullied you. They did. Uh, in, in, in fact, uh, a lot of the landlords didn't want us in the in the supermarkets. We probably drew a crowd of people that were. Were not you a bit down market? Were you a bit down market? I would. No, we weren't. But <laughs> they were a bit up market. Oh, I see. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Uh, at what point did landlords start taking you seriously, though? I think at the stage when we bought checkers, because then they didn't have too many options left. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, it, it's so interesting. I mean, you and Raymond Ackerman have been rivals and have crossed paths. For, for decades. You bought the uh, food business of Ackerman's food stores in the 80s. That was, at that time, by then, controlled by Edgar's. And then you went and you bought Checkers, which Raymond Ackerman previously run and so famously got fired from and then gone and started pick and pay. Um, but you eventually bought Checkers, and it was like the fish swallowing the whale. They were three times bigger than you. Yeah, it wasn't actually that... Is, okay, we had a big fish that was helping us in the sense of Sunlam. Because you knew the Sunlam chairman, and that was yeah. Marina Stalin was a good was friend. Marina Stalin, a friend of yours. Okay. Mm. So what happened is that at one stage, um, I think Sunlam inherited checkers with a long story through partners that sold, didn't sell, sell etc. But they could only get something like twenty or fifteen cents of the bottom line coming through to the Sunlam holding with a lot of companies in between. And uh, then Marinus asked me to join him, and I said, I, I commit suicide on the beach, not in my office. Uh, Did Marinus want you to go to Sunlam? Yeah, he was very keen for me Pulis to come. Yeah. No, no, not to Pulis, to go and run checkers. To uh, run checkers. Yeah, so I said, no, no, it's not, it's not a good wish of yours. And, but I did say to him that one day when you're ready, Let's merge the companies. And then I have got a lot of friends who are, because, well, then in the end, ShopRite was a big company, and Checkers was very big, as you say, it's a whale. So I needed people to help me turn that around. And then, uh, then I spoke him into it. Actually, Christo at the end uh, was on board with, uh, with the discussions because I told him what had happened. And we bought then, we merged, we bought a, a, one of the holding companies of Checkers we bought, and then we sold ShopRite into it to get control. Okay. To at least get a proper flow through of, of, of 
profits. Because Czechos yes. had gone through its heydays um, in, in the 1980s. Clive Wheel, um, mm. Twally for Twally. Um, you know, everybody remembers Clive yeah. Wheel. And, and then the wheels did come off Checkers. It, it wasn't a, a great business. And, but what's surprising is it took you just nine months to turn Checkers around. That's at least what the, what the, the research says. Yeah, it's true. You know, the, it wasn't a, it was never a bad business. It was badly focused at the business that it could have been, and obviously they had different cultural sort of backgrounds to to it. Uh, the disciplines probably weren't as good as I would have liked them to be in in the, in the total group, but they were fan, they were fantastic guys in Czechos. They just needed support and to and to 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 run the business. Uh, Sergio Montenegro, that was the CEO at that stage stayed on with us for 10, 15 years um, as uh, running the, the, the franchise operation. So, no, it, was, it wasn't really a bad business. It was a bad business run by people who, who had different ideas. Mm. And, and I went there the first day, and then, uh, then we went into... Tell me about lunch. Tell me, uh, tell the me, lunch. Tell me about that first lunch, well, the last lunch. That, the first lunch you had, <laughs> and, uh, and, the, and the last lunch they had. Now, now, normally, lunch in ShopRite means that at 5 o'clock, you discover that you missed the lunch. So that's, <laughs> that's lunch. We don't have starting times, we don't have closing times, we don't have lunch times on paper. But we do have them, if you can ask, they differ within half an hour. And when I got to Checkers, it was fantastic because this, they said at about 10 to 1, I have to prepare myself, wash my hands to go and have, <laughs> have lunch in this beautiful dining room with waiters with uh, white gloves. It was very nice. It, I felt like one of those biblical queens who got fed, uh, fed nice uh, oranges and, and, and grapes. And um, so we had this lunch in different three courses and everything. And I looked at the people around the table and I said, you know, guys, this is, we're losing 45 million rands a year. This lunch is in, in conflict with what I think we should be making and where we should be going. And I said, have you guys heard of the Last Supper? They are they everybody? <laughs> I said, well, this is the second time. This is the last lunch. <laughs> locked as from tomorrow morning. So we, we locked it, and uh, we didn't have a lunch there again. But it, it shows the importance of culture, I suppose, in, in acquisitions. And you made multiple acquisitions over a long period of time. Uh, tell me about, I mean, Grand Bazaars. Grand Bazaars. It was a deal yeah. that didn't happen the first time. I think you had to go back at least two or three times before you managed yeah. to buy it. And again, you're buying these businesses in quite quick succession. Now, Grand Bazaars was a nice deal because Barney Rogat, my partner in ShopRite, he, he actually was a 25% or 30% partner in Grand Bazaars before he started ShopRite. And he had a disagreement with the then owners of or the major shareholders of Grand Bazaars and literally chucked his shares. Uh, he was so cross. So when we bought Grand Bazaars, we were in final. Yeah, you know, we actually were, we actually we were we were ready to have the cocktail party. The food was already dished up. Then something came up uh, that Manuel Schacher, who was then the chairman of Grand Bazaars, wanted to stay the chairman. And I said, well, not a problem with me. We can make you super chairman or whatever <laughs> you want to be. But Barney says no, he doesn't serve under Manuel. So I said, well, hell, now we've got a problem. So we'll have to form another company. But Big arguments, and um, there were small things there. And then Manuel says, "Okay, well, then he's not selling." And I said, "Well, that's fine. We will probably meet each other down the road one day." And Carlos Dos Santos is also a very good friend of mine. Carlos Dos Santos, um, he was a big retailer in those yeah. days too. Yeah, yeah, yeah he, he had uh, the cash and carry business, which yeah. is very smart. Metro cash and carry. Yeah, very smart guy. Really smart. And he went and bought it and uh, kept it for three or four years. And then I walked through his fridges one day and I saw, but some of the fridges are switched off. They only stock Coke and some of Gerald's uh, cool drinks, which didn't need uh, cooling. Uh, so I phoned him and I said, Carlos, I see you're a bit short of profits and money. Uh, can't we talk about your grand bazaars? And he phoned me, he says, come and see me in Joburg. So we, uh, we did about two hours and we did a handshake deal. And, uh, and that was it, so we bought the company. And in fact, I'm not sure, but I think we paid slightly less than what he paid for. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'm talking to Whitey Basson this evening. He is the deputy chairman of uh, ShopRite. He, until last year, was the chief executive of many, many years standing uh, of ShopRite. Uh, I want to talk to Whitey Basson about doing business in difficult times because so often we feel very sorry for ourselves sitting in South Africa in 2017 with cabinet reshuffles and shakeups, with politics being very uncertain, with an ANC elective conference coming up in the tour, in, so just before Christmas time. Yet, Whitey Basson decides to list ShopRite in 1986. What was happening in South Africa in 1986? It was just after the Rubicon speech. We defaulted on our debt. We were in deep junk. We were going from emergency to emergency, recession to recession. And he thinks, this is a good time to list a company. I think a lot of people can be inspired by that. And it feeds nicely into a question from the floor. I'm going to read it. And somebody's written in lots of words. What criteria has the board of ShopRite used over the years to justify continuous investment in South Africa? What gives you faith in the future? What gives you an optimism? What gives you a sense so that you'll get a return on your investment? I'm summarizing a bit. But you, you've kept doing it through thick and thin, through crisis after crisis. You've continued to invest and grow. Well, I think if you look at, uh, at South Africa and the history of South Africa and the peaks of valleys, now you've just spoken about the 76s, etc., 78s, but there were lots of lots of Rubicons and other mistakes and stupid mistakes happening in, 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 in South Africa. It's a, it's a developing economy. It's not something which will be there forever. The major portion of South Africa is carried by the growth in population and the homogeneous population of all South Africans, if you can call it in South Africa. So no matter how we fight, there's always a solution at the end of the road. So some of us should go to jail, some of us don't go to jail. <laughs> but uh, which, which category do you put yourself in? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I'm on the forgiveness side. <laughs> as long as the business grows and as long as poor people can get live a decent standard in South Africa, I, I really don't mind if anybody goes to jail or not. But but that's my that's my philosophy about it. But South Africa has all the the elements in in it to be a world class country. It it can provide it should provide a decent standard of living for everybody concerned. And I'm actually very positive for the next 20, 30 years in that the younger generation of South Africans are now connected to the outside world, understands the difference between right and wrong, understands the difference between getting a return on investment and not getting a return on investment, and can see television that there is a life different to the life that you may have or may be forced to live. And, and for that sake, I think they will stand up and, and actually get back on track. Yasin Wacha says, hi, Whitey, any chance that you would run SAA for a year or two? <laughs> Must I answer? Preferably using English words that are in the dictionary <laughs> and are longer than four letters. If they can keep the politicians out of the portion that I should look at, then I would uh, seriously consider doing it for free. So it's a, so it's a no, then? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, yeah. you know, it's... Uh, it's the age, old age problem in the sense that people interfere into businesses. Uh, why is ShopRite successful? Crystal never interfered into the into the run of the business. Did you guys ever have a, a serious disagreement where you where you where you like were off speaks for a while? Yeah, yeah. In the last couple of months, we were off speaks for a long time. But uh, why? Ah, just because you know I didn't like the style of his car or something like that. <laughs> Serious issues. I mean, you, you worked together for 40 years. There must have been a point where you bashed heads quite seriously and stuff. No, I don't think in, for most of the times we bashed heads about policy of the company or where we're going. Christo actually never interfered in the workings of ShopRite. Uh, he's, he's not that type of guy. And, uh, and obviously, I didn't interfere into his structures of dealing and switching things around. And he always makes sure that he gets the best... Deal, of Cut. course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's always a dealer in the pack, and I think he's got a joker in the middle where he knows now I'm in, in Whitey's territory, I start dealing softly now. You know. But no, we never had a problem, and, and that's the problem, that a business can't be run by five different people or decisions made by lots of people. And In South Africa, the problem is probably now that we've got so many regulations, it drives you crazy. It's very, very difficult for somebody young to actually to actually put down a profitable business. So you buy on the JSE at a 20 PE. Now that's a job for Warren Buffett and not for an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. 
and the young guys can't make it. There's just too many, too many things they have to do. You have to fill in so many forms. And uh, hey, I got a sense from you toward the end of last year that you just got tired of that nonsense. I mean, I, I, mean you, I think I say nonsense. I mean, regulation is very useful. It protects consumers, blah, blah. But you, you just got fed up. Of, it wasn't fun anymore. You know, I, 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 I did a lot of things since, uh, since I semi-retired and now in my retirement. And I changed banks and did a lot of stuff. And then if you find... If what did your bank do to you? Why did they upset you? They didn't do anything to me. They just gave That's me... That's the problem. They gave me 28 pages to sign of a contract <laughs> which I couldn't understand the first letters on. I think I signed four times and initial 25 or 26 times at the bottom. And I said, what is this all about? I don't understand it. You don't even understand it. So why do you do these things to people? And the whole world is in South Africa is unfortunately turned that way. I, I, I had a nice little story, but... We tried to give away 70 uh, stoves to people that can actually cook, bake uh, bread or tart, milk mm. tarts, etc. And we, we had three takers in the end because when, the, when they were delivering goods to the supermarket, the health department said, no, you've got a tile to the roof, put a thing that extracts the heat and the cooler can't be more than so many degrees, etc. And then you drive down the street and you see, yes, yeah, there's ox hanging from a, yeah. from a tree <laughs> and somebody's chopping it up with a, and selling it. So uh, formal business is just bedridden it's by, by uh, ad over-administration. So Tina Lacordeur's question flows very neatly into that. Uh, where uh, do you think the opportunities lie for building, re for budding re retail entrepreneurs in South Africa? Do you think retail success is dependent on scale? Is there hope for budding entrepreneurs like Tina Lacorda? You know, if... Well, how old is Tina? 27. I don't know. I can't, I've not seen her handwriting. Where's Tina? Well, I give different advice to different ages of people. Where's so. Tina? <laughs> Tina, put up your hand. We want to see Tina. 35. 35. You look 26, Tina. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You can start afresh. <laughs> no, I, I don't think that there's a there's advice that you can give. To. It depends on the on what you want to do and how and how how that department or that portion of the business is tied into government legislation, health, uh, Judge King's corporate governance. Corporate governance. King uh, four five. Yes. I mean, our our financial <laughs> statements are that thick. Yeah. And I, as a job... He's, he's showing a pile of paper three inches thick, for those of you who can't see. Yeah. And, I mean, it's it's really... it's really. Um, I don't understand what it's all about, but, I mean, you have to write it. So, <laughs> so if you want to start a business, just stay out of those. I'm not sure that there's some people start businesses and they, 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 they're not so good at paying uh, taxes and so on, so they seem to have a better chance in doing business, but that's not the way you should go. I think there are opportunities, and if I would in reinvest today, I would probably look at uh, tourism, because tourism is one of those areas that if you're good at it, you can make a lot of money, and it's in South Africa is on the verge of becoming even much better as a tourist in, uh, industry. Don't get into manufacturing, because uh, those things, they eat at night, and when you sleep, they still eat your money. There we go. Some good advice. Good advice. Uh, Whitey Basson is our guest this evening. He is our shapeshifter tonight here on The Money Show. Some very courageous advertising done by checkers in the last couple of years. Uh, former footballer turned chef. Gordon Ramsay has done a couple of ads. Nathaniel has done some ads. Gordon Ramsay, did you hire him just because you wanted to meet him? <laughs> and Nathaniel I, and Suzelle. Nathaniel is a, is, a, is a good friend. He actually comes from Portable, so he doesn't what? admit it. Yeah. He doesn't admit it. No, well, well, he's, he's, sorry, Nathaniel. He's, uh, he's a bit shy on that one. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but Gordon Ramsay, I actually never met. That was done by our marketing guy, Neil Schroeder, who's a brilliant guy. And when he told me about Gordon Ramsay, I didn't know who the hell it was. So, <laughs> so I said, well, if you like this British guy, get him in. And it, was, it, it actually did work for us because I didn't understand that so many people had followed him in yeah. South Africa. And we actually had poor Nathaniel in the, in, the, in the studio with Gordon Ramsay, but we didn't tell Gordon Ramsay who he was. Had they been scrick? No, no. Nathaniel made him scrick a bit. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it worked for us, but that wasn't me. I, uh, I, I didn't do it to meet him. Okay, Bazaars, 1997, you pay SAB one rand. Yeah. Did you ever think to yourself that one day you had to run out of luck? Do you think you were lucky? No, no, that was that was not a, a lucky break. Uh, in, in fact, uh, the one rand is is not totally good. Yeah, well, but it's a nice story. Slight, slight, no, no, that's what we paid, but mm. we we may have received something else. You, you got some liabilities. Yeah. No, 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 no. We, that was the we had a NAV of 130 odd, 140 million that we got for our one rand. So it was it was actually a very nice deal at the end of the for both of us because. Uh, SAB lost a lot of money, a couple of hundred million rands a year in, in Oki Bazaars. And I, I tried, I stalked them for three years in the days of Maya Constor. Yeah. I remember once coming back from Zambia and I had a terrible upset stomach. And they're going to wait for me in his office. And I said, where's your office? He says, that big office out there. And I said, that big office with that big desk. He says, yes, that's mine. <laughs> so, and, he, and he looked at me and he said, uh, yeah, Whitey, you can have the company. 250, I think it was, or 350 million up front. A day after Christmas, and uh, you can't look at it, no due diligence. And I said, Mr. Khan, even a horse thief is allowed to look at the teeth <laughs> of a horse before he steals it. <laughs> and then three, three years later, we bought it, uh, three years later down the line, we bought it, which was a, a complicated um, negotiation, but um, worked out for all of us. They did very well out of it because they got rid of a liability which they couldn't run properly. And, and we, made, uh, we made profits quickly out of it. Mm -hmm. It also gave me the opportunity of actually dividing between ShopRite, Checkers, and OK Franchise. So yeah. I could split the stores to fit the segments of the customers that they sell. And that's where the game changed, because suddenly yeah. Checkers could be more upmarket, ShopRite right. the middle market, yeah. and then um, OK and, and you save then in, in more yeah. of an emerging market. Yeah. Was there ever a point in this 40 years where you, were, you lost sleep at night, where you got a bit frightened that maybe you'd step to overstepped yourself? No, I, I, you know, I, I was so tired. Was, <laughs> I, didn't, I couldn't lose sleep, then I would have died. So it, was, <laughs> it was very hard work because we had to work against the loss of a million rands a day. I mean, when you put all your money on the table and there's a million rands a day being lost by that red company, then you work very hard and, and long hours. But... I never had a doubt that we could turn it around. They had, good, they had a very good um, uh, uh, shops, which was yeah. just badly oversized and badly uh, operated, but in principle, a very good company. In fact, I, the biggest fears I had was that uh, Raymond Ackerman would buy it. If he had bought it, I would have been in more serious trouble than when I'd bought it. So, <laughs> <laughs> When you looked at the rest of the African continent and you looked at the opportunity set that was available for ShopRite, that was an aha moment. You were on a holiday with your family. In, I think you went to Zimbabwe and you went to Mozambique and you looked on the streets of Mozambique and you said, there's commerce, there's activity, there's... Many people are spending money here. And maybe it's like this elsewhere on this continent. This is early 90s. Yeah, we, we actually were, we weren't actually on a holiday. We made it a holiday, but we wanted to sort of see what goes on there. So we, we had a security guy with a Jeep and campus, which I had to drive the air conditioning flaked out, I think, at Nell Sprite. <laughs> <laughs> there were bottles that big in it. And, and then we went through Mozambique, through Zimbabwe. But I always kept my eye on, I, I knew Mozambique slightly from the times as being a student where the old LM was. So, you know, we used to put uh, 10 cent or two cent pieces in the in the light switches and switch it on so that they short out all the lights in the hotel. So it was uh, a <laughs> student play field. But, uh, uh, but that, that wasn't a... a, a, a Maputo was, was an easy ca uh, country. It was easy to, because it was close to South Africa, yeah. et cetera. When we moved up to the north, that was more difficult. You, you didn't make it in Egypt. You, you tried India. I mean, you have not had unbridled success. There have been some tough things. I mean, no, you've no, not had India, it all we, your own India, way. India, India we, we, we would have made it big time if we... Uh, if I think I will come out of retirement if the Indian government actually allows us to go back. Uh, in, With in, Modi, in, uh, I mean, it's political leadership again, isn't it? Well, the, the, at some stage we were allowed to, to open supermarkets. Then we had to form different structures, etc., with trusts, etc. And there was paper, and, and you just went no. And, and we, no, we, we traded there. We traded very successfully. Okay. We had an IPA there, 
And then we just said, no, we can't build anything new and we can't expand it. But it was a very, very successful business for ShopRite. And as I said, we would like to get it. Egypt was a different story. I knew Egypt wasn't going to stand the test of time because we had, you know, I always have contracts, which is what we're going to do and what are we going to do. I always have, I always have a divorce contract in my contract as well because you have to have that. I didn't have one with my wife, so that's why I can't leave. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> that's why she can't leave. Yeah, never no, there. No, then she can really. Uh, but if I had one, I would have been much more tough with her. You know. The, <laughs> but Egypt had Egypt. Yeah. They didn't worry about contracts, so it was bad. Seventy-two next birthday. Yeah. You've just finished working. It's yeah. been a remarkably long career, a well-paid career. I'm curious as to what your family buys you for birthdays and Christmas. <laughs> well, my eldest son, Adrian, buys nobody anything, so that's starting off. So he's been trained by Wim Christo, then? No, he's, he's, he does, just doesn't spend money. Good, sensible, sensible, yeah. good lessons. My wife and I, no, listen, we never lived anything of a lifestyle. All the nonsense they read in the newspapers of your salary, etc., etc. I don't think I ever looked at my salary for the last three years. Uh, I, I have you would have got a big fright. <laughs> no, I read. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, what's his name used to remind me in the newspapers, uh, 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 Anne Crotty, and I would say, oh, "Are you sure the figures are correct?" And then she, yeah, I read it in the financial papers. But we don't live as a as a family to say how much money can we spend and what do we drive and what don't we drive and so on. If you did it all again in 30 seconds, would you do the same thing over, or would you go back yes. to medical school and? Become a no, doctor. I would do the same thing over. I would just make sure that that the mistakes I made, uh, I didn't repeat. And I did make mistakes, personal mistakes, in the sense of I didn't structure my own wealth structures and my and my con long liberty in the company correctly. But for the rest, I would have done exactly the same. It gives me great pleasure to see not the money that you made, but the people that work for the company. But there are 130,000 people whose lives are dependent. Listen, of the, just take ten percent of them, and they phone you, and the, and and I love them, and they love me. That's good enough, ladies and gentlemen. Please, will you give a very warm round of applause to Michael Bishop? He's very kindly given us an hour of his time this evening, and uh, to everybody at home, thank you for listening to the special edition of the Money Show. Our shapeshifters feature.